right, Psalm chapter 3. You can follow along silently while I read Psalm 3, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which save my soul. There is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to Dig into your word tonight, dear Lord, in this great songbook, the book of Psalms. God, I ask you that you would please open up the scriptures to us tonight. Pray that you would please help me to teach the words that, that we're going through tonight in this book, that help me to teach them in all truth and, and righteousness and honesty, dear Lord. I pray that you would just, just use me to, to, to teach the things that you taught me and um, Pray that you would open up our ears, help us all to be focused and listening intently on your word so that we can all learn, and that we wouldn't be distracted with things going on around us, and that we wouldn't be distracted with the cares of this world or other things going on in our life, dear Lord, but we can devote some time to, to study and, and to hearing your word. God, open up our ears and open up our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so Psalm chapter 3, let's dig right in, verse number 1. The Bible reads here, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. See, now this is something that we're going to find a little bit of, of a theme as we go through the book of Psalms. Is um, a, a lot of the Psalms have to do with being in times of trouble. Be going through hardships, having a lot of enemies, having a lot of people raised against you, but ultimately putting your faith in God, trusting in the Lord, and relying on God to be your defense, to be the one that you can turn to, to keep you safe when you have all the troubles in the world coming around you, to be able to rest and be confident and be sure in the Lord, and to not be bothered and worried and troubled about everything else that might be facing you. Now, um, and that's, we'll see that, and there's a lot of variations um, along that, that main theme as we go through, we're going to get to continue through and see that oftentimes. Now, in the book of Psalms, there's m many of them, I believe most of them are um, attributed to David as being the author. Now, we know in the Word of God, ultimately, God is the author of the Bible. These are God's words. When we're reading the book of Psalms, yes, it's a song book. Yes, these were sung. These were psalms that were sung in the congregation. But they're also God's words. And the, the, the origin of these words came from the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that um, God, who at sundry times in a diverse manner, spake unto the prophets in time past, hath, uh, hath spoken unto us these last days by Jesus Christ the Son, that God is the one who who spake his words. I was actually just showing this to someone out uh, solely today. I don't want to misquote it, so let me read it again. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1, tells us basically how we got our Bible, where Scripture comes from. And I just want, I'm going over this because I want to remember this, that yes, while these are songs, they're still God's Word. This is still Scripture, and that's why we're, we're studying this and we're learning from this tonight. Hebrews 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, so in different ways, it says that God that he spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, the point that I was making, I was only, and the point I want to make tonight, I think is a good point, is that the Bible says here that God, you know, in various ways, spake. Unto the fathers by the prophets. So what does that mean? God spake 
to the fathers, to a bunch of people, to, to the progenitors of the people that were being addressed here in the book of Hebrews, right? He spake to his people using the prophets. And who are the prophets? Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, you know, all these various men, they're prophets. And God used those men to speak his words. When, when they spake God's word, that was God speaking to them. God used various ways to speak unto the fathers using the prophets. So when we look at God's word, we treat this as such. This is not just, oh, and, and people will do this, especially in the book of Psalms. As we get into this, we're going to see various Psalms that don't line up with other people's theology, with other people's doctrines, and, and the things that they've come to hold well, many of the book, many of the verses in Saul and the various Psalms will go and contradict that. So the way they reconcile the fact that the Psalms will say things, and we're we'll into this a little bit later tonight, even about God, you know, bringing vengeance and judgment, and David, you know, praying in these Psalms that God will execute judgment and wrath upon the wicked people of this world, and and the people that don't want to. And admit that this is God's word, they'll say, oh, well, this is just how David felt. Oh, this is just out of David's heart. This is just the words of David. And they try to push it off as if it's not God's word. But I'm here to tell you tonight that these are God's words. Yes, David may have penned down many of these, and, and some of David's emotions may come through God's word, but they're still authored by God. It is still Scripture, it's holy scripture, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. These are God's words, so let's treat them as such, and let's look into this. Now, the first two verses I just read here, he's explaining how, you know, how many people there are there are against him. They're increased. There's so many people that are rising up against me and fighting against me. And if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says that you shall suffer persecution. That we can expect trouble, just as David is describing here, that there's so many people that are against him. Living a righteous life, you know, it can get you some real good friends, but it's also going to bring along a lot more enemies. We want to, to obviously stick close to our friends, make good Christian friends, other laborers, other fellow workers. We see that the Apostle Paul had many friends. You can read Romans chapter 16, all the people that he's greeting and saluting, and he's saying, say hi to this person and this person, and you know, uh, special blessings for these people. They helped me out, this person helped me out, and he greeted his other epistles. He had the same thing. He had a lot of friends. He had a lot of people that he was working with, a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ that, that he cared about, that he prayed for. But look at all the enemies that he had. You can read through the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. You can see where he has, um, you know, in, in one passage he lists off all the things that have happened to him. He talks about being shipwrecked. It talks about him being stoned. It talks about him being a night and a day just out in the middle of the ocean. It talks about being in perils of robbers. In perils of his own countrymen. Just Various dangers. Why? Because he had people that were out to get him all over the place. The people that hated God's word would actually go out and incite others, other mobs of people to be against him. It can seem scary. And this is one of the points of this psalm, of this psalm here in Psalm 3, is that David is, is speaking to God. He's addressing God, saying, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? There's so many people out there. It seems overwhelming. They're rising up against me. Many of the people would say, my soul, there's no help for him in God. But he's going to God seeking help, seeking comfort. And we're going to find out just in a, in a few more verses that he gets that help so much that he's able to sleep great at night, even though there's so many people that are out for him. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 27. In, in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, the Bible says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Again, that's the Apostle Paul saying that, Hey, I've got this great opportunity. God's opened up this door for me to do a great work. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to work for the Lord. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to win souls to Christ. And there are
There are many adversaries. There's many people that are going to try to stand up in the way. They're going to oppose the good work. And if you want to do a great work for the Lord, be aware that there are many adversaries. There are going to be many people, family or friends or acquaintances or other people out there, the God-haters of the world. I'm not saying all your family and friends are, but the God-haters of the world are already going to be adversaries to you. But sometimes even those that are close to you might be an adversary to you. And we need to be aware of this. And we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord to help us to get through that so we don't just back off and quit and stop doing what's right because there's somebody opposing us. Now, obviously, it would be much easier and better if we could just do this work without having all the troubles. But the troubles will be there because there are people that hate the message of the Bible. Now, there's also going to be times here where, uh, where people might mock. When you're trying to do good work for, for God, and then all these low points happen, right? Maybe some, some disaster strikes your family. I, I remember hearing um, that story that Pastor Boyle uh, gave us in, in the, at the, um, the preaching conference, the post-trib Bible prophecy conference. He related the story, and, and it fits in perfectly here with Psalm 3. He related a story where he uh, he was a missionary. He came back home, and I think he had. To, and I don't remember the story verbatim, but basically it was it was one where you know he was asking questions about the pre-trib versus post-trib and stuff like that. And I think it came out that he would you know he had changed his mind on the position, and and you know the pre-trib mafia basically just just cut him off and said that you know. He couldn't pass the church. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't do all these things, and they were going to have, some, have no support for him anymore, or anything like that. And then, in the midst of all these problems, I believe. Do you remember the story? Less was it his wife that that like got really ill, or one of his children? Something really bad happened. It was his wife. Maybe she had a baby, and the baby. And there was complications with the baby. You know, his wife was was pregnant. She was just having this baby, and all, in the midst of all this stuff, right? He was, he was having these problems. He's at the hospital. He's, he's on his knees. He's praying to God, you know, to help him out. And, of course, there's Job's friends that come in, and basically they're just, you know, looking down as if, oh, yeah, you know, you're not right with God and all this other stuff. And, and there's the, the people that were basically saying that, um, you know, this is all happening as a result of him, you know, not being pre-trib anymore. Which is ridiculous in and of itself. But those are people who are supposed to be his friends. I mean, those are brothers. And I did not get any indication that those people were not saved. Those are people he knew very well. And I think, I'm sure he believed that they're completely saved. And I believe they're saved just based off of what I've heard, based on the testimony. And there's no reason that they can't be saved. But what a horrible thing to have a brother or sister in Christ to have somebody like that to be you know, down on you and mock you, especially during your low points. Now, when you are trying to do what's right, when you are trying to live the godly life, many people might mock you and even say things like, well, where is your God now, huh? And, you know, obviously that's not something any saved person should ever say, but there's other people, unbelievers, that, that would say things like that. Well, where is your God or, you know, God's abandoned you. That's, that's the way they treated Jesus Christ himself. As I do turn to Matthew 27, look at verse number 39. The Bible says, and this is when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, bearing the sins of the whole world in his own body. Out of love, he's nailed to the cross. He's still continuing to work. And he's bearing open shame. And he's bearing reproach. And he's bearing the sins of the world. And he's hanging up on that cross. And what are they saying about him? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 39, And they passed by him, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging or shaking their heads at him, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And they're mocking him. And they're taking out of context the things they said. And actually, what's, it's interesting here because they're saying, you destroyed the temple bills in three days, save thyself. Well, guess what? In three days, what's going to happen? He's going to rise again from the dead. 
He is going to hold true to those words that he said. But they're reviling him. They're mocking him. They're ridiculing him. And it says in verse 41, Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. This is saying that, oh yeah, he, he was really big on trusting in God. Now where is his God? Now where is he to deliver him? For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. That is what they said and did to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ. Unless you're better than Jesus Christ, if you're going to be Christ-like, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to try to walk in his ways, you can expect the same type of rebuke and ridiculing during your low points. So let's face it. For us, him being nailed to that cross and bearing our sins can be perceived as a high point because, hey, he's paying something that we deserve to pay. He's doing something for love out of us, but for him, that's a low point. He's bearing shame. He's bearing iniquity. He's bearing this stuff. That is not the, the, you know, the, this, this high point. And if anything, you know, the high point comes three days later. The high point is the resurrection. Praise God. That's what assures our, our salvation. But he's at a low point. He's at the lowest point in his entire life being nailed to that tree and being mocked. Being ridiculed. And they're blaming, essentially they're blaming God and say, oh yeah, he's trusting in God. Don't be discouraged when you go through the low points. When you start having the problems. I mean, even in this church, you say, well, where's all the people? You've been around for a while now. Where is everybody? I'm not going to let myself get discouraged. Whether, whether there's health problems, anything else. Look, if you know that you're doing right, you can have many, many adversaries. And people may be trying to stop you and stop your work. Like they tried stopping Nehemiah's work. They tried stopping Ezra. They tried stopping great men of God from doing great things for God. But they would not stop the work, no matter how many adversaries there were. They said, no, we're going to keep going. Having many people against you, I want to point this out as well. Having many people against you, turn if you go to John chapter 7. Having many people against you does not make you wrong. That's the way that this world thinks. This world is going to tell you that, oh, if you're in the minority on whatever subject, then you must be wrong. And people always want to point to, oh, you believe such and such, but don't you know that 75% of the people believe different than you? That must make you wrong. No. That doesn't make you wrong. The truth is the truth no matter what. And people always will try to marginalize your belief and make you think, you know, even though there are a lot of people that believe like we believe, there's going to be those that want to marginalize and just, just lessen what you really, oh, you, you're crazy, no one believes that. No, actually a lot of people do, but it doesn't, it, that doesn't matter. If I was the only one that believed a certain thing that's true, it doesn't make it false. You know, the, the world and the media are trying to always brainwash people into thinking like things like, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the most common narratives out there? You know, the global warming thing. Oh, well, this global war, man made global warming and all this other stuff. Oh, all of the, sci all of the scientists believe this, or evolution, right? Oh, all the scientists believe that, that of course, we came from monkeys and a rock and, and that, you know, they, life just appeared out of nowhere from non life materials and. Of course, that's settled science. And they try to marginalize and downplay and get you to believe a lie by making you think, nobody believes what I believe. But guess what? We shouldn't care about that either. Because it doesn't matter if everyone else wants to be deceived into believing a lie. We ought not to. Embrace the truth. Having many people against you doesn't make you wrong. People so often want to judge our stance on issues as being wrong because they're not always accepted by the mainstream Christianity. We want to downplay what the Bible says about homos being put to death in Scripture because that's not a commonly held belief anymore 
by these so-called lamestream Christian churches. I don't care what they think. I don't need them. I don't need anyone else to tell me what God's word says because I have his word in my hand and in my heart. And I know what it says. And I know what the Bible says in Leviticus. And I know the pronouncement and the judgment that God has made on all types of sin. And I'm going to stand with that. And I'm going to stand with God. And hey, let God be true, but every man a liar. God has the truth. God's word has the truth. And I don't care what anyone else thinks. I mean, look at, and I return to John chapter 7. This is what the mainstream religion said about Jesus Christ when they rejected Jesus Christ. That's the same type of mentality that they had was, oh, you're in the minority. Look at all, the, look at all these people that haven't believed in Jesus. Since the Pharisees aren't believing in him, then no one else should. That was the way that they thought. John chapter 7, verse 45 proves it. John 7, 45 the Bible reads, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. So these officers were sent to arrest Jesus Christ and bring him back. And when they went to do that, Jesus confounded them and was speaking wisdom and truth. And they were astonished, and they, they, they couldn't go out and wrestle because they, they weren't able to do it. They weren't able to find fault with him. They weren't able to even trip him up in his own words. And they're like, Nobody speaks like this guy speaks. And look at their response to him in verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Oh, are you tricked too? Like these other people, these other simpletons, these other, you know, these people that are believing a lot, are you, are you tricked by him too? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. These people don't know what they're talking about. They're ignorant. They're stupid. You know, just like people want to say about us Christians. Oh, you believe, do you believe the Bible? You believe God's word? Oh, you're an ignoramus. Oh, you don't really know anything. You're one of those dumb people who believe the Bible. Yeah. That's the same attitude the Pharisees had. They were respected the persons. And, and who were the fools? The Pharisees. Who were the fools? The God haters. Who were the fools? The man that said in his heart, there is no God. That's the fool. But we don't have to worry about that. They'll, they'll find out one day. The problem is, though, that we're still, we still have this human flesh. And sometimes our flesh will, will cause us to fear and doubt based on, you know, a multitude of people being against us. Luke chapter 6, we're going to hear some good wisdom from Jesus Christ. Luke Chapter number 6 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 6. It's kind of a shorter version of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Luke chapter 6. We're going to look at a few verses here. Verse number 22, the Bible says, Blessed, blessed are ye. He's saying you're actually blessed. It's a good thing. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. So I thought it was a bad thing. It doesn't feel very nice when people hate me. That's why Jesus explains, you know, actually it's a good thing sometimes when people hate you. For the right reasons. It's not good if people hate you because you did something bad to them, because you, you murdered somebody, or you, you, did, you stole from them, or did something like that. That's not good. You don't want people to hate you for that reason. But he says, blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. Now I have anything to do with you. They're going to separate you. I don't want to hang out with you. I don't want to be friends with you. I don't want to talk to you. They shall separate you from your company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, for Jesus' sake. They won't have anything to do with you. Why? Because you're a Christian, because you believe the Bible, because you believe in Jesus. Be careful, and kids, listen up, because there are going to be people out here that are not going to want anything to do with you because you believe in Jesus. But you need to stand strong with Jesus. And be right with God because that's more important than worrying about everybody liking you. If you know right now that there are going to be some people that won't like you at all because you're a Christian, it's better and it'll be easier to handle when the time comes. Just to know that that will happen. Now, it won't be everybody. Especially my children. You still have mom and dad that, that, that are there for you. We're not going to uh, back out on you, but no matter what, even if mom and dad did get really stupid and, and, and turn their back on you, God never will. 
And this is why in Psalm 3, David is calling on the Lord. That's the, that's the first person and the best person to call on is God for our strength, to be our Savior, to help us in, a, in our problems. So he says here, it's actually a blessing when people hate you and cast out your name as evil for Jesus' sake, for the Son of Man's sake. He says, rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Think about how happy you get that you're actually ready to jump up and down. Man, it's so happy. That's the type of joy we ought to have. When people cast out our name as evil because we're, we're following Jesus. He says, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. That's why you can be happy about it. For in the, in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. See, that's the same thing they did to these prophets that, are, that were revealing God's truth. The prophets that, that spake God's words. They treated them the same way. So don't be surprised when they treat you that way. You can stay and stand by God. He says your reward in heaven is going to be great. So even though you might not be happy that there's people hating you, you know there's no reason to be happy about that except when you realize that you are earning rewards in heaven by staying true and faithful to God and not compromising or changing your belief and going and associating with people who, who hate God and you stand with God, that earns you rewards in heaven. And, and when you think about that, that is something to be happy about. That is something you can you can take comfort in. He goes on to say that in, beside, you know, he, he said there's a few verses in, in Luke 6 where he talked about people being blessed. He said, hey, it's a blessing when people hate you and curse you. But then he goes on to say, what, what's a woe? What is sorrow? In verse 26, Luke 6, 26 says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. He said, it's not a good thing when everybody just says, hey, you're great. When everyone's speaking well of you, everyone, nobody has a problem with you. If you don't have any enemies, woe unto you. When there are no adversaries, woe unto you, because guess what? You're probably not doing the work of Christ. Christ and all the prophets all had adversaries. If you don't have adversaries, you're doing something wrong. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Easy way to identify the false prophets of the day. The people that the world can love and accept and promote and endorse. Those are the false prophets. Why? Because they have no adversaries. They're accepted everywhere they go. When you get a preacher, go into a Catholic church, go to a Pentecostal church, go into this church, go to that church, go to this church, go to that church. They're doing something wrong. Get on TV. Be loved by the world. They're not preaching the whole counsel of God. Because you know what? The whole counsel of God is going to divide. It's going to separate people. It's going to cause there to be adversaries and it's going to cause... Your name to be drugged through the mud. Let's go back to Psalm 3. So David is expressing the fact that there are so many adversaries. Now, this isn't just one person. This isn't just a fight that he's having with one person. And it says here in the beginning of Psalm 3, it gives us the, the reference of this psalm. It says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Apparently this psalm was written when David was fleeing and had to leave the kingdom because of his son Absalom. But the, the evil that Absalom did, it wasn't just Absalom that he was concerned about. Absalom turned the hearts of, of many people away from David. By and large, the kingdom was turned away from David. Not everybody, of course, but, but a huge number of people. He says, there's many people rising up against me. Many of the people he thought were his friends. Many people that were close to him. Many people now are turned against David. And he's just trying to do what's right. And now they're saying, oh yeah, where, where is God for him now? Because they knew the stories of David. They knew David was always giving God credit for all of his victories. David gave God the credit when he beat Goliath. David gave God the credit when he would be winning these battles at war. 
And at this point in his life, when Absalom then tries to take over the kingdom, it's well known and established, hey, David is trusting the Lord and seeking the Lord as his counselor, is seeking the Lord for his help, is, is relying on God to protect him. And now this bad event happens. Now his son has turned against him. And now he has all these enemies. And what happens? They all start to mock and ridicule. He has all these adversaries speaking against him and saying, oh, yeah, he trusted in God versus God now, huh? I thought you trusted in God, David. But what's going to happen? God does take care of him. God does defend him. This is a low point, And we're all going to go through and be brought through low points in our lives. But we need to maintain our integrity to God. Verse number 3 of Psalm 3 says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. He goes to God saying, Hey, there's all these people against me, but you know what, God? You're my shield. A shield is a protection, right? You go out to battle, your shield is that big barrier to stop any of the attacks coming against you, to stop the arrows, to stop the sword, to stop whatever, whatever weapon is being used against you. The shield is going to protect you. And he's saying, God, you are my shield. You are my protection. I'm relying on you. My glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me. Out of his holy hill, Selah. Now, what a comfort it is to know that God hears our prayers. David is saying, hey, everyone's against me. The whole world's against me. My son is against me. But I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me out of his holy hill. When we are in our times of problems, we can remember, and not just remember, but go to God first. That's why we sang that song earlier, Have You Thought to Pray? You know, before you left your house this morning, did you think to pray? Let's go to God with everything. Why? Because God hears us. We're His children. We ought to be going to God. We ought to be relying on God, especially when bad things happen, when, when trials come up. Let's rely on God to be our strength. We're praying for a lot of people in our prayer requests, and I pray that God will give them the comfort and the wisdom to go to God and not just go to Him, but to be able to rest in Him and know that God will bring them through their trials and their hard times, even if you know people might have family or friends or other people against them. To stand sure in God and in His Word. One thing I just want to point out in Psalm 3, verse 4 he says, I cried unto the Lord, and then adds, with my voice. We live in a, in a day and a time, I think, where just our culture, especially our Christian culture, I think the majority of times people pray internally. We pray in our minds, you know, we pray in our heart. And, and I do this too, and I think that is probably the majority of the time. But let's not let those prayers be the way we pray all the time. You know, obviously we don't want to pray as like this big speech just so people can hear us and think how holy we are. You know, Jesus gave us the example of that, of, of how to pray and how not to pray. But let's not forget to pray with our voice. There are times, you know, when the Bible talks about going home, you know, going into your closet and just praying unto God where no one else can hear you. Open up your voice. It may not always be practical to be praying out loud because it will just draw a lot of attention to you and people might think, you know, you're walking down the street, you're, you know, whatever. You're, you're in an environment that's just packed full of a lot of people. You know, maybe kind of distracting or whatever. You know, there's reasons why you can pray. And it's not because you're ashamed of praying, by the way. It's not, that's not a good reason to, to not pray out loud. But depending on where you're at, you know, if I was to pray without ceasing, there's going to be times where you're praying where it's not necessarily appropriate to be speaking out loud. But you're still going to be praying in your heart and in your mind to God. But let's not forget, even though that it is very convenient to pray in your heart, let's make sure there's times where we're getting on our knees, or we're humbling ourselves, or we're falling flat on our face before a holy God and entreating Him and giving him the respect and honor that he deserves. And, and, and praying unto God with our voice. And, and making that known and just using our voice and not just our hearts or our head to, to 
cry out unto God. That's why he says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. That means he, he just called out and said, God, help me. God, I know you're my defense, and I'm trusting in you, but I have so many adversaries. Don't be afraid to cry out to God. God hears our prayers. What, what a great thing. And then in verse number 5, you know, verses number 1 and 2 talks about the distress that he's in, the trouble that he's in, because there's so many people against him. Verses number 3 and 4 talks about, you know what though? You know, I have all these adversaries, I'm going to trust in God, he's my shield, he's my protection. I cry out to God and he heard me. And I know my God hears me. And then in verse 5 he says, I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord to sustain me. Now, this is a great demonstration of faith. I want you to think about this. Because in verse number 6, we're going to see the trouble that he was in. Verse number 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Ten thousand. Think about how many ten thousands. Tens of thousands of people. That's a lot of people. To put that in perspective, think about the town of Prescott Valley that we live in right now. Imagine you being in this town, or us, let's say our family, our little church here, and having every single person in this town surrounding us and being against us. Every single person. Because our town is roughly, you know, 40 to 50,000 people. That's tens of thousands of people. If every single person were against us, if every single person were against us, that would be what David is describing here. He's saying, well, I will not be afraid of tens of thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. It's not that they're indifferent to what he's saying or they're not interested or they don't care. They're actually enemies to him. They're adversaries. Hey, kids, pay attention. Turn around and pay attention. They're enemies. Think about it. So many people will be around you, but not being afraid and not caring and not being afraid so much that you're willing just to go to sleep. Normally when you have a lot of problems, it's hard to sleep because your mind is thinking about these things. You get nervous, you get worried, you're scared, and it's not easy to sleep. But we can sleep when our faith is in God. No matter how many people are against you, the entire town could be against you, but you can sleep well knowing that God is there to protect you. Verse number 7, Arise, O Lord, save me. He's calling on God saying, Look, I can't fight this battle. I can't win this, God. You need to fight for me. Protect me, Lord. I've got a lot of enemies. Save me, O oh my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 58. I know we're going through the book of Psalms. We're not even going to get to this. I mean, even if we were going through all of them, there would be a whole other year before we got to this anyway. So let's look at Psalm 58 because this is one of those aspects I brought up at the beginning of the sermon. And this point will come up again in the future, but there are people that don't like and they want to they make excuses for many of the Psalms. We see here in verse 7 of Psalm 3, say, hey, God's, God's smitten. You know, he, he hit my enemies. He beat him up. And he says, thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And you know what? That's a good thing. That's something that David is exalting God for and basically thanking God for. So they have all these enemies against me. You know what? God beat them up. God broke their teeth out of their face. Yet today's world wants to tell you you should never be happy when God judges ungodly people, wicked people. But that's not what the Bible says, and that's not what Psalm says. David was happy about it. And I had to turn to Psalm 58, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Now, the reason why we're reading verse 3 is just in the context, that's why I get you to see this. That he's talking about the wicked. And he goes on and on and talks about this down to verse number 6. This is a plea 
unto God of what to do to these wicked people who are doing wickedness from the mother's womb and, and are just doing real evil things. He says, break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. This is a righteous call for vengeance. Now, the Bible does say that, you know, vengeance is mine. I will pray and say the Lord. It's God's job to right the wrongs. It's God's job to step in and to handle the problems. It's not our job to make sure that every sin is punished and everyone that does wrong is going gonna, is gonna to be judged for. It's not our job. Now, it's one of the reasons he instituted a human government to punish evildoers. But it's not our job to just go off and, and right wrongs and do things like that. But you know what we can do when, you know, when wrong is done to us? We can turn the other cheek, as Jesus said. But while we're turning the other cheek, we, we go, and, hey, God, look what's going on here. Why don't you recompense this? We're going to have, take the high ground. We're going to have the right attitude as far as suffering wrong to happen in general. We're not going to, you know, be getting into fist fights and stuff when people are, are, you know, casting out our name as evil and things like that. We're just going to be happy about it. Say, hey, great, fine. Go ahead, persecute me. We don't see the Apostle Paul getting all these fights even when people are, are, you know, stoning him. But what he did do is he put his faith in God. He trusted God and God and God delivered him through all those things. And what we see in Psalm 58 is David going, hey, God, break their teeth. And you know what? I, I hope that God does get those the wicked, ungodly, evildoers that are going out and defiling and, and preying on children. You know what, God? I pray that you would please just strike them dead. God, I pray that you would cause them to die a slow, horrible death that are going out and defiling little children and destroying lives, God. I pray that you would please bring judgment. Oh, God, break out their teeth. That's a righteous prayer. God, I want you to do that. That these wicked doers that are going out and just plotting and planning evil upon people would be brought to nothing. Break out the teeth, the great teeth of the young lions, O oh Lord. These are the words of God. It's righteousness. Don't get brainwashed by the world and don't get brainwashed by lamestream Christianity that's not willing to stand on God's word and every word of God. We can trust in God. Why? Because he will take care of things. He, he is a God of justice. God doesn't let the sins just go unpunished. He doesn't let the wicked doers off the hook. There is a recompense of reward. Sarah, stop that now. Back to Psalm 3, verse number 8. We're going to close up right now here. Um, last verse. The Bible says in Psalm 3, 8, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. God brings our salvation. God's the one that saves us. God's the one that will save us. He'll save our souls, first and foremost, out of trouble, out of the pits of hell. But not only that, God isn't just the Savior of our soul. God is the Savior of us. God will save us in our times of trouble, in our times of, of persecution. He will save us. He can save us. He is our Savior that can get us through anything that we go through. God will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able. And we should always be looking to God as our Savior. And the, the last point I want to make is about turning Galatians chapter 3. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cover this very in depth because we did already. We just recently went through our Bible study through the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number three. Because at the end of the verse 8 there in Psalm 3 it says, Thy blessing is upon thy people. God's blessing, this isn't talking about the Jews. This isn't just saying God's blessing is just upon the Jews, it's just upon the seed of Abraham, if that's the only people who are blessed, and that's who gets the blessing. No, when it's talking about being upon thy people, it's talking about believers. It's talking about people who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that have their trust and their faith in the Lord, those are the ones 
that have God's blessing because they are God's people. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 13. And read the whole chapter in context. I'm not going to go through it all tonight. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We receive that. Girls, stop it right now. Separate yourselves. And listen up. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith. Look, we are the ones. We are God's people. The Bible says that, that it's not the flesh that profited. It, it's not the, um, the physical seed of Abraham. John the Baptist said, you know, God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. That physical seed means nothing. The promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, which is Christ. That those blessings that were made unto him would also come upon us, upon other believers, through Jesus Christ. The blessing was made to Abraham, the blessing is to, to Jesus Christ, and because by proxy through Jesus Christ, we receive those blessings as well. The blessing is upon us. So when it says, thy blessing is upon thy people, you can apply that to yourself as a believer. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the the great instruction that we could receive from these psalms. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to understand them more. I pray that you please open up our, our eyes. God, help us to have the, the strength and the courage and the uh, just the knowledge and understanding to be able to rely on you in all our times of trouble, no matter how many people are against us, dear Lord. We know that we can rest at ease. We can go to sleep at night knowing that you're there to protect us. What a great feeling. What a great God that you are and protector of us. I pray that you would please help us all to strengthen our faith to, to be able to fully trust in you, your Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.